being here. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for this opportunity. Also, um, acknowledging people that contributed to this work. So this is our football team in, at the Federal University of Paraná, in the very south of Brazil. So this is Professor Alexandre Dias Ribeiro, who is my main collaborator. And the others are PhD, master and undergrad students. Um, so that's the plan of the talk. Um, I, I think the idea is to give you s highlights of some very modest ideas that we have been developing in Curitiba in the last, in the last few years, which are about these foundational questions. So I'm going to introduce some formalization for the idea of reality, and then, and then I will try to explore this notion and see what we happen what we we what we learn with with these other aspects. So let's start with reality. So throughout this talk, the notion of reality is to be understood as definiteness of a physical quantity. So I, I would say that this this notion appears in in most approaches to this to realism or to reality. Also, you can find something uh, like this in EPR's criterion of reality, where you have full predictability without any disturbance of your system. But here we are taking a, a, a different premise to, to reality. So that's my basic premise, which I think it's reasonable. So the idea that after a measurement of an observable, say, observable A, you do have an element of reality associated to A. Or if you wish, A is an element of reality. So that's the premise, okay? And then I'm going to construct what we call a quantifier for reality, or irreality, which is the dual notion, okay? So, so suppose you have here some preparation. It can be a multipartite system, if you will. Um, but to consider this bipartition, so here we have space A for a particle. You have for the other particles of your system. And then you submit this state to a measurement of an observable A that acts on this subspace, okay? We assume it's a non-degenerated uh, spectrum. These are projectors, okay? And then that's what you have after a measurement. So suppose the outcome is small a, so that's the, sorry, that's the reduction of the resulting state. And, and then if you, if you run this experiment several times, of course, in each time you have a different, a different outcome. And then if you want to describe the resulting state at this point, you have to sum over all outcomes, possible outcomes with the pertinent probabilities. And you can, you can write this state in this form as well. And then you notice that this is just a completely positive trace preserving map, okay? And now comes the point. Given our premise that after a measurement, you do have an element of reality for the measured observable, then we propose to, to take this state as a state of reality for A, for the observable that you have measured, okay? And then so, the situation is the following here, you have no irreality associated to A because you have just destroyed the irreality that you have here when you performed the measurement. We say that here you, we have no irreality. Here we can have some irreality that is dual to reality. And then this quantity here measures the irreality of A given the preparation row. So you see, all you have here is this comparison. S is for the phenomenon entropy. 
So here we have the von Neumann entropy for the preparation, and here we have the von Neumann entropy at this point. And this difference in our approach measures irreality. So because of the, the monotonicity of the von Neumann entropy upon um, positive maps, this is always non-negative. Okay, so, and also, it will be zero only when you have a state of reality in the very preparation of your system. So if you plug here phi A of rho and here, then because of this property of this, of this measurement, then you have zero. Okay, so that, that's what we propose as a quantifier for the irreality of this observable given the preparation. You might think at a first sight that this is just a measure of quantum coherence because you are comparing by means of this um, entropic distance, so to speak, you are comparing the, the state with a state that is diagonal in the eigenbasis of A. But this is not quite the truth because this is a multipartite state. Okay? In fact, you can prove, it's a simple proof, that you can split this irreality in two terms. The first one is indeed associated with coherence, because here you have the irreality of A given the reduced state. So it's in, in fact a measure of coherence, quantum coherence, in this eigenbasis, the eigenbasis of A. But the other term is up to a minimization quantum discord. So you do have here quantum correlation. So in this sense, if you accept this notion of, of reality, then you cannot think of reality as being defined locally just by looking at the reduced state. You really need this other term in order to, to, to speak of this quantity. So that's why we, we call this the inseparability of reality. You cannot conceive reality locally, as Einstein did, for instance. Of course, if you take this as your quantifier for reality. And you can also prove this uncertainty relation. If you take some results derived in this, in this reference here, you can prove for maximally incompatible observables A, and A prime, so they do not commute, and their eigenbases form a, a, form a mutually unbiased uh, basis, okay? then you can prove this lower bound, which, which is related to the information associated to the reduced state. Okay? So, full stop, that's the first third of my talk, just trying to introduce and formalizing some notion of reality, and then I move to non-locality. So the question is the following. So that's the paradigm of non-locality, Bell non-locality, which is about the violation of this hypothesis, the hypothesis of local causality. And, well, we can clearly see here a statement, a statement of locality, because what happens in this laboratory is not influenced by what, what occurs in, the, in a remote laboratory. So what occurs here is not determined by what happens there. So for me, it's a, clear, it's a clear statement of locality. However, it's not so clear to me where realism comes into play in this formula. So that's the question. Where can we find at this formula here a precise notion of realism. Okay, I think it's, it's debatable. Okay. I'm going to take the following position. I'm going to use what I have just introduced about realism, about reality, and then try to formulate some notion of non-locality out of this. And that's what we, we did here. So. What, what we have is just a trivial comparison between the irreality of A given rho and the irreality of A given that some measurement has been performed in a remote laboratory. Okay? 
And of course, if these two terms are not equal, then we have some, so to speak, some flavor of non-locality because the measure change the measurement in, in Bob's laboratory is changing somehow the reality in Alice's laboratory. And you can prove some 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 uh, properties and skip this. And you can also try to, to move one step further. You can try to to quantify the amount of locality which is associated with the state alone. Here I have defined what we called realism-based non-locality for a context, a context defined by these two observables and the preparation row. But here I'm trying to define the amount of non-locality associated to the state alone. So we maximize over the observables. And you can also prove this is a non-negative quantity. Okay? And moreover, you can prove that there is no anomaly of non-locality because when you take here a pure state, then this, this quantity reduces to entanglement. This is the entropy of entanglement in this bipartite scenario. So it, it's nice in this sense. Okay. And now, of course, you can try to compare this with the, the mainstream, with Bell non-locality. So for this case study, we take this state, here you have the singlet, so a maximally entangled state. Mu is just a parameter in, in, in this domain. And here you have identity. And then we compute CHS quality. Of course, for this state, these expectation values uh, are very simple to compute. That's the formula. And for so you have here four directions. For, for your measurement, uh, two in each laboratory. So you have two angles here, two angles here, and so you have a parameter space which is eight-dimensional, so you have to choose these angles and see a violation of this Bell inequality, this, just the traditional stuff. But now we introduce some new parameters which simplify the parameter space to three. Now we have x, y, and z in this domain. And this has in a certain, I mean, we assume that this has the same content of non-locality that we can find using this eight parameter space. Okay. And now, in order to compute the degree of non-locality of the state or the amount of non-locality of the state, we take two, two traditional approaches. The first one uh, amounts to, to use the maximum violation of the, the Bell non-locality. Okay? And the other one, instead of taking the maximum vi violation, you count the configurations that violate. So you sum over all possible violations in this violation space, so to speak. And then we can compare these two Bell inequality measures with ours. Um, I have to say that I, I make here another normalization that to put all the measures in the same scale. And in blue and red, we have, so in blue you ha we have the volume of violation. In red, we have the maximum violation, so uh, Bell measures, and in black we have the realism-based uh, non-locality. And we can clearly see he here that below this point, below this value, we have no uh, Bell non-locality whatsoever, whereas we do have some, some aspects of non-locality associated to this, to this measure. Full stop again, That's, that was the, the second uh, third of my talk, and now I'm going to discuss a little bit of another thing that you can do if you accept that notion of reality. Okay. So it's about complementarity between information and reality. So um, this is a work with my PhD student, Pedro Diagis, has been published this year. 
Uh, so we take this uh, notion of information in this work, and also we, we introduce what we call monitoring. There is no fundamental uh, reason for that, I guess, but what you have to, to, to understand is, is that this is nothing but an interpolation between two regimes. The first one, if you take epsilon as one, then you have this term here, which is about a projective measurement, just as I have just told you a few minutes ago. But if you take epsilon equals to zero, then you have just identity, so you do nothing with your state. So that's why we say that this interpolate between these two, these two regimes, uh, projective and identity. And then when you take uh, some value in between, you say that this um, implements theoretically what we call a weak measurement. Okay. And then we use, we use that, these ideas and the notion of a reality to, to look at this story here, to, play, to tell a story about this, this, this problem. So we prepare a state for the system, and then, in order to implement the, the weak measurement, we let the system interact with an ancilla by means of this unitary operation. So that's the initial state of the ancilla. And this is just a mathematical result. If you trace over the ancilla, then what you have here is precisely what we had in the previous slide, which is the monitoring. So that's a unitary story for this a uh, weak measurement, and then we can, we can use our quantity to, to infer the amount of irreality that we have here at the beginning, and the amount of reality that is asso associated to this, to this monitored observable at the end, and then we, we compute the difference, how the irreality changes when you have this, this monitoring, and you, we can also compute what we call the reality change, which is just dual to e reality. It's just um, another way of, of, say, of computing these things. And then we have the following story. Because the whole dynamics is unitary, then you have the conservation of the information because of the uh, unitary invariance of the von Neumann entropy. So the information of the whole system is conserved. And then we, ha we can split this term in three. This is for mutual information between the system and the ancilla. This is the information associated with the system and the information for the ancilla. And then as uh, the entangling dynamics uh, takes place, you have an increase of the mutual information because of entanglement, and then you have a decrease in the inf information associated with the system. So this term decreases uh, while this term increases. So that's what we call a kind of complementarity. In fact, these two terms, you can prove, they add up to a constant. So it's a complementarity in this sense. As information flows, to the ancilla, then this term increases, then you lose information about this, the, the system, and then the reality of the observable increases. So that's the story we, we can tell when, you, when we accept these notions. Okay. Also, it's interesting to notice that when you have pure states, the amount by which the, the reality of A increases is precisely the entanglement okay, between the system and the, and the um, ancilla. Um, also, we can prove some bounds. We can, we can, we can prove that whenever you have um, a weak measurement of an observable A, the reality typically increases. But also, you have an increase of the reality of an, an incompatible observable. So you have a kind of overall 
overall increase um, in the reality of the, of the system. Of course, uh, I, I would say that this is somehow intuitive for, for many, but what we have here is, is a formalization of these notions using this criteria or this, this fire of reality. It's, I would like to mention this paper that, have, that has been published a few months ago. Um, it's a kind of experimental test of these ideas. It has been conducted uh, by Marco Barbieri and collaborators in Italy. And what they have, they have done was to, to measure, to perform a weak measurement of, of the state of polarization of this photon, if you wish. So they try to see what happens with the reality of the polarization. And so that's a qubit that you're, you're in photon. And in order to perform this weak measurement, they, they introduce this meter photon, which of course is also a qubit, and they use this theta here, this parameter, to uh, regulate the intensity of the measurement. So you, you can see here the, the relation, that's precisely the parameter that I have just shown in the previous slides. So that's the way to implement the weak measurement in this photonics experiment. And that's the experimental data, so that's what you have here in these blue circles, the data. This is for the theoretical prediction. And so here you have a picture of the reality change for the polarization of the incoming photon given the intensity of the measurement. And so, of course, you have full agreement here. And they have also been able to, to show that this, these results respect that bound that we have derived. OK, um, so let me just summarize uh, what we have been done. The idea is, is quite simple, actually. It's very modest. We just try to, to make the notion of realism a little bit more quantitative or a little bit more formal, if you will. And then we, we try to use this to, to understand a little bit more about non-locality and complementarity within this new context, right? Just to mention some um, other questions that we have been done to ourselves in our, in our group is, can we somehow extend these notions to some kind of tripartite uh, non-locality? As I have shown, all, you have at the, all we have so far is a kind of, of notion that applies to this bipartite scenario. So we would like to, to go one step further. Also, we want to, using this, this formula, to, to think of scenarios where we have a weak non-locality. So instead of using projective measurements, we use uh, 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 weak measurements, and then we still see some signs of non-locality. Um, also, we would like to, to see whether we can put all these things within some resource theory, so that would be interesting. And also um, trying to understand whether, it, what, what happens, that's the question, what happens with all these, these quantities as you change reference frames? So that's a very foundational question, I would say. I cannot see uh, uh, immediate applications for, for that question, but it would be nice to understand and what kind of quantumness, irreality, entanglement, no locality, bad locality, how these things change when we move from one, one reference frame to another reference frame, and moreover, this can be a quantum reference frame, which is something that we can discuss about. But that the question is, can you see some sign of absolute quantumness? Is there something that is preserved when we, when we change reference frames? 
So that's the question. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>